Well, hello everybody. This is going to be a really interesting video for me personally, and I hope it's going to be for you too, because the launch of Intel's 13th gen processors probably raised a lot more questions than it had answers for a lot of you guys, because on the day it launched, reviews typically fell into one of two categories. Either these processors were fire-breathing monsters that sucked back a ton of electricity and were almost impossible to cool, or the reviews like ours said, these things, they are still power hungry, but they are a lot easier to cool than you might imagine. That means that typical air cooling can keep something like the 13900K cool enough to reach optimal frequencies. But which is right, which is wrong? Is there even a middle ground to that? That's what I wanted to find out in this video. This isn't gonna be your typical temperatures versus clock speeds video either, or one of those sort of side notes that's shoved to the end of a video, because I really wanted to go in depth and discuss how different cooling solutions from basic heat sinks to AIOs behave on Intel's 13th gen CPUs. From the air cooler side, there's the Deepcool AK400, which is a budget heat sink that goes for about 35 bucks these days. There's also the AK620, which happens to be able to match the best of the best air coolers in most tests. For AIOs, I've got Deepcool's brand new high performance LT series, and these are probably some of the best looking AIOs I've seen so far. There's just the right amount of bling with this simple but oh so cool geometric pattern on the pump. And the price is pretty sweet too, at about 140 bucks for the 360 millimeter and 110 for the 240 millimeter design. And for those of you keeping track at home, that 240 millimeter, that's pretty close to high end air coolers these days too. And at this point, we may as well take a little bit of a breather, I guess, and talk about today's video sponsor. Dimitri, take it away, buddy. The all new G360A by Fantex, bringing updated design inside and out to refresh the P360A chassis with a legendary breathable, durable mesh front panel for improved cooling and that awesome illumination peeking through via the three DRGB front fans. The interior is now made to accommodate 360mm radiators at the front and top, longer GPU support and user-friendly assembly. The dual color options are great for an all-white build with complementing cooler, fans, and PSU. So check out the new Fantex G368 cases down below. So let me start right off at the top by describing some of the crazy, crazy behavior that we're starting to see on Intel's 13th gen CPUs. It's so frustrating. I'm telling you guys, this is gonna be really me angry because we've been down this road over and over and over again, and it keeps on coming up. So I guess the first thing that I have to talk about is Intel's power levels. Before Alder Lake, PL2 or Power Level 2 was the maximum allowable power for short durations, usually used for bursts of higher clocks at the beginning of an all-core workload. After that short PL2 burst, the chip would fall to PL1, which is the long-term power limit. As of Alder Lake and now Raptor Lake, PL1 and PL2 are essentially the same if and only if your motherboard can handle it. So the processor will strive to remain as close as possible to its maximum turbo power provided it's running cool enough. Anyways, the maximum turbo power, according to Intel, for the 13900K and the 13700K is 253 watts. Meanwhile, the 13600K gets cut back a bit to 181 watts. Now, that seems pretty simple on paper, right? And on Intel's website. But this is where we get into some dodgy ass motherboard business. That's because many, but not all boards, push things even further than Intel's maximum turbo power right out of the box, in their auto settings without any any user input. Why? Well, to win or cheat or whatever you want to call it in comparative benchmarks. ASUS calls it multi-core enhancement or MCE. On MSI, it's enhanced turbo and Gigabyte has enhanced multi-core performance and so on. But regardless of what the feature is called, it'll push wattage to the maximum allowed by Raptor Lake even if it's beyond Intel's own guidelines until it hits its T-junction, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Thereafter, it's gonna do one of two things. Either it's gonna keep on going balls to the absolute wall, or it's going to back off the gas a little bit. I wanted to actually give you a little bit of a snapshot of what that looks like with the Z790 Maximus Hero and a 360 millimeter AIO running at 100% fan speed in an all-core blender workload. And during a 10 minute workload, 
Here's how the 13900K behaves when running at Intel's defaults. It strives to hit 253 watts, and since there's enough cooling capacity, that's exactly what it does for the entire run. Some manufacturers, ASUS included, have their auto setting pegged the 13900K to 300 watts and around 100 degrees Celsius for a predetermined period of time. In this case, it's 96 seconds, and then dial down to the CPU's maximum turbo power of 253 watts again. It's sort of like a PL1, PL2 situation for Raptor Lake. Others just shoot for the moon and remove Intel's limits altogether as their out of box default. The Hero has a setting which does that too, but you physically have to select it, unlike some other manufacturers where the auto setting behaves exactly like this. And this is what running without limits does. The motherboard does absolutely everything it possibly can to hit the absolute maximum CPU wattage, which in this case is 300 watts. The only thing that holds it back is, you guessed it, temperatures. Because the effect of running without limits on temperatures is pretty damn dramatic. We're talking about running straight up to 100 degrees almost all the time. That's a massive difference from running at Intel stock settings or even the Asus auto profile that eventually falls right back into line with Intel's default spec. And look, this is exactly why you're seeing so much talk about 300 watt fire breathing 13900Ks. It's not even sensationalizing per se, because on some but not all motherboards, this CPU will run hot and consume absolutely insane amounts of power. While Intel allows this and calls their own specifications guidance or guidelines, this is something that happened actually back in the Z490 days and everybody, and I mean everybody, was critical of motherboards enabling MCE when they just come out of the box, when you just pop a chip in there. What has changed? I have no idea. One thing is certain though, showing this kind of behavior, it makes for an amazing thumbnail. I'll give everybody that. But there's one thing that you also really have to take into account here. All that extra juice doesn't really affect overall clock speeds over longer periods of time. While the Asus auto setting will be amazing for bursty workloads like short benchmarks, the final delta between running at Intel's bone stock config and without limits at close to 300 watts on average is 150 megahertz. Yep, that's about it. All that power and heat for less than a 3% bump in frequencies. So it's pretty simple, isn't it? If you are running one of those motherboards that runs your 13900K without limits out of the box or you set no limits yourself, you're obviously going to need one of these guys, a 360 millimeter AIO running at close to 100% fan speed, period. Point final, you can stop watching the video right now. But what happens if your motherboard runs at Intel's defaults or falls into the same category as the Asus one here, which goes all out for a little while, but then settles down to the standard 253 watt baseline. In terms of raw temperatures at 50% fan speed, all these coolers, what do you know, get hot. Even with the fans running full out, over 90 degrees is pretty much par for the course for anything under a 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. But after seeing the correlation between temperatures, power, and clock speeds before, these readings don't really matter all that much since a cooler can be running hot, but that doesn't mean it's running slow. And the 13900K's frequencies prove that. At half fan speed, none of them throttle down to Intel's base clock. Yet, there's some benefits to upsizing your cooler or running with high speed fans when running an all core workload on this chip. Once everything is said and done, the delta between the best cooler here running all out and a basic heatsink like the AK400 operating at a near silent fan profile is about 350 megahertz. Meanwhile, looking at actual performance, you can clearly see there's a law of diminishing returns here. Even an air cooler like the AK620 can get the chip running at almost peak performance while running super quiet. Increasing fan speed narrows that gap even more where there's only about 30 seconds separating the 360 millimeter AIO from the budget heatsink across a 14 plus minute render. All this isn't to say that you should be cheaping out on a cooler when you're buying an ultra high end processor like the 13900K, absolutely not. You should not be looking at cheaping out on basically anything if you're plonking down that kind of money 
for a CPU. But what it does prove is that without all that motherboard ridiculousness stepping in, you can achieve optimal performance from the 13900K with a high-end air cooler. But what about gaming? Because I know, and you guys know, that the vast majority of people who are looking for this processor are going to be using it probably for gaming, not for all core rendering workloads, because the vast majority of people who are doing those high-level renders in Maya, in Blender, have moved on to GPU compute anyways. And there's obviously a lot less power needed for gaming than a full core load. So even with ultra quiet acoustics, the 13900K is a hell of a lot easier to cool. Boost RPM more and temperatures plunge even further. The two AIOs though do show their strengths over air cooling. Yet there's a flip side to that coin because every single cooling solution here allows you to get the best possible performance when we run an average across six games. So by this point, I'm sure that some of you, maybe a few of you are starting to reevaluate what the common narrative is about the 13900K. I mean, look, once you take those motherboard shenanigans out of the equation, it is still extremely hard to cool, except in gaming to a certain extent, and the amount of power that it consumes will probably make a FX 9590 weep, but it is a lot more manageable than you might have originally thought. And what about the 13600K? For the time being, it's the entry level processor of Intel's 13th gen, so it's bound to be popular, but being more budget friendly comes with some strings attached too. First and foremost, it needs to be easier to cool than a flagship CPU because the last thing I want is to spend a small fortune trying to tame a $330 processor. So let's set the stage to see how it behaves without limits at ASUS's auto limits and at Intel's defaults. Well, isn't this interesting? At every single setting, the power consumption stayed exactly the same. In this all-core blender load, it just sticks to an average of 135 watts, not Intel's maximum turbo power of 181. Let's dive a bit deeper to see exactly what's happening. First of all, it's pretty obvious the 360 millimeter AIO keeps the 13600K cool enough. I mean, it doesn't go above a peak of 67 degrees, even in the worst case. And this is exactly why nothing's moving. This chip was able to hit maximum frequencies without needing Intel's 180 watt maximum turbo power. And it did it with temperature headroom to spare. That's the trifecta for Raptor Lake, folks. To break that down just a little bit more, rather than looking at averages, Intel lists the maximum turbo frequency here as 5.1 gigahertz on the P cores and 3.9 on the E cores. Now that is exactly, exactly what we got. Even though this chip has 54 watts technically of additional headroom, it will not go one iota above that without manual overclocking. This is completely intentional too, since the last thing Intel wants is for the 13600K to potentially compete against a more expensive 13th gen CPU. Meanwhile, the 13900K can swing for the fences with its unique thermal velocity boost and turbo boost max 3.0 technologies. But what we saw just now was the LT720 360 millimeter AIO running at 100% fan speed. So that is the best of the best situations outside of, I guess, a custom loop that you would see on the 13600K. But what happens if you just link that with more affordable air cooling and water cooling solutions? Well, with fans running at half speed, everything here gets decent numbers, even the entry level AK400. Turn things up a notch and temperatures, of course, go lower. But does the 20 degree delta between the coolest running heatsink and the hottest one actually make a difference? The answer is nope, not one bit. Because even when running at 85 degrees, the 13600K can still hit its maximum turbo frequencies. So 5.1 gigahertz on the P cores and 3.9 on the E cores for an average of 4.8 across all cores, even in a workload like this. Of course, that also leads to performance being identical regardless of the cooling solution too. I just need to emphasize again though, make sure you get the best cooler you can afford, even if it's a less expensive air cooler. Because as far as entry level air coolers go, the AK400, so this guy 
right here is one of the better ones on the market. So it might give some people, and I'm talking to you, whoever you're going to be, a little bit of overconfidence that you can completely cheap out on an air cooling solution when it comes to cooling the 13600K. And it really is not okay. But anyways, I wanted to move on to gaming here and I'm gonna go through this really, really quickly. Since power input is so low, the amount of heat being produced is less too. So pretty much any decent cooler, yes, even small form factor heat sinks will be more than enough to keep the 13600K cool during gaming workloads. Of course, there might be some edge cases out there, but overall, every single one of these coolers in this video, from a 360 millimeter AIO to the AK400, was able to deliver low temperatures and identical gaming performance. And that's good news for anyone who might be worried after seeing some of those far out 3900K results. And that's pretty much it, and I'll be completely honest with you, unlike a lot of times, I don't really have much to add to this conclusion because I think the numbers speak for themselves. It's pretty obvious. If you're running an intensive, all core workload all day, every day, the 13900K, even operating at Intel's limits, will require a beefy cooling solution in order for it to hit optimal performance. But it's nowhere near as bad as some people make it out to be, especially in gaming. You just need to understand that out of box results will vary in a massive way from one motherboard to another, since some of them run the chip outside of Intel specifications. On the other hand, the 13600K is infinitely easier to cool. Even a good entry level heatsink will have the chip running at its best. So I guess that's it for this video. I really hope that you enjoyed this one. At the very least, I hope it cleared up a little bit of the confusion surrounding these new chips from Intel. I know that a lot of you said to me when I did it for the Ryzen 7000 series, it really helped, I guess, take away some of the fears about cooling those chips and maybe added a few more. Anyways, I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day, guys.